Last month, a national report found that 43% of children in West Belfast are living in poverty. It comes as the benefit system is being overhauled in the most radical shakeup in a generation. We have a perfect storm in terms of both the material deprivation and the austerity. Tonight on Spotlight, what it's really like living in poverty in Northern Ireland today. So about three, four pound left. That's to do me till Friday. And this is Tuesday? This is Tuesday. And why, when it comes to helping out the poorest, our politicians' hands are tied? We are doing everything we can to ensure that there's an adequate system to protect and support the most vulnerable. This is Jackie Higgins. For the last four years, she and her two children, Sean and Anya, have been living on benefits. I lived in a bought house with my partner. The relationship broke down and the house got repossessed. So I was left homeless with the two kids. I worked full time, so I did. Right up until about four or five years ago. Life was better when I was working. Your mind was occupied, you had money, you had you had a comfortable life. Do you know what I mean? Whereas now, I'm not working, I'm living off benefits. And I'm counting every penny that I have that comes into the house every week. Jackie says that the benefit system has helped push her into a poverty trap. So we're going to follow her over the course of a fortnight. We'll see the choices she has to make and the daily challenges she faces in keeping her family fed and clothed and her home heated. Ten pound on each cash. Each story of poverty is different. This is Jackie's. Are you saying that your life now, financially, it's just not viable, really? That you're just your head's not above water, really? Definitely not. Definitely not. And it'll take a long time before it is. According to a recent report, Jackie is far from unique, and the area she lives in, West Belfast, is one of the most deprived in the UK. The End Child Poverty Organisation published a map last month showing relative poverty levels across the country. West Belfast was second in the UK. Derry was fourth and Strabane fourteenth when broken down by local authority and council areas. Taken as a whole, levels of persistent child poverty in Northern Ireland are higher than any other region of the UK. So what does poverty really mean in Northern Ireland today? And what effect does it have on those who are in it? I'm going to try and cover today because it's Banbridge, County Down. At this conference, poverty is on the agenda. For me, I'm really going to try and help you understand, to, to some extent, the extent of child poverty. Poverty, and especially child poverty, has become a major issue across Northern Ireland. On average, just over one in four children here lives in poverty, with almost one in ten living in severe poverty. We have a perfect storm in terms of both the material deprivation um, of families and households and the austerity and how government is dealing with that austerity and the impact that that's having on disposable income. Several decades ago, poverty in Northern Ireland meant scenes like this. Since then, there's been a steady increase in the standard of living across society. But even today, in Northern Ireland, real deprivation still exists. And those working on the front line of poverty relief say that once again, that's on the rise. This is the Thriving Life Church in Newton Arts. Joanne, hi, how are you? What's been happening here over the last year reveals just how difficult it can be for some families to put food on the plate. 
This is an emergency food bank. And even those who run it are taken aback at how many people in dire circumstances have come to use it. This is our warehouse where the food is stored. Where does it all come from then? It's all donated by uh, local businesses, um, the community, churches. Um, we have uh, food bins, various food bins placed around the town. With cereal. Volunteers parcel up the non-perishable food items according to charity guidelines. Allocation is adjusted for the makeup of the household. Then would be uh, four tins of beans. How long has the food bank here been running for? Uh, we opened in December 2011. Have you seen an increase in demand since then? Well, for instance, in December 2011, we fed 50 people, and December 2012, just last year, we fed 317 people, men, women and children. So, more than a six-fold increase in 12 yeah. months? Yeah. Were yeah. you surprised by that? Absolutely, we were. We didn't think whenever we started that the need was as great as what it is. We've had people before who um, have come on a Wednesday evening, for instance, and they haven't had any date from the Monday. Now, I think at this day and age in Newton Arts, it's really, really difficult to kind of comprehend, but that's, that's how it is. What kind of states are people in when they come in here and they need food? A couple of weeks ago, we had three families that um, walked here. One family four miles, the other two um, walked five miles. Um, children were with them as well. So people walked four or five miles just to get here? Yeah. With yep. children? In Newton Art, yeah. What really strikes you about the food bank here is the exponential rise in the number of people using it. 50 people in December 2011 and over 300 in December 2012. So there do seem to be a significant number of people out there who are not just in financially difficult circumstances, but who are actually going hungry. Jonathan Bell is one of the Stormont ministers with responsibility for tackling child poverty in Northern Ireland. He's also one of the MLAs for the Strangford constituency where the food bank is located. It's not an affluent area, Newtonards, but I know when I see them bringing the sugar and bringing the milk and bringing the canned food up to the thriving life that people are making a genuine effort to support those most in need. And what can government do? Well, what government can do is to use the resources we have as strategically as we possibly can so that we can intervene earlier, that we can keep as much money within the family home as possible. Jackie's story shows just how complex the issue of poverty can be. She lives in a pleasant, comfortable home. Hi, Hi. The house has been adapted to ensure both children have a bedroom. That's the two bedrooms that were split, yes. Although one of the rooms is very small. But Jackie says she's on the breadline. So how tight can things get financially? Very tight. Very, very tight. I mean, I'm sitting here at the minute of a few pounds left, of about three, four pounds left. And that's to do me till Friday. And this is Tuesday? This is Tuesday. So you, so how much have you? Three, three or four? It's three or four pounds now. Yeah, it's three, three, three fifty, three fifty. And that's to do for the next four days? Yep. That's to do me till Friday. When you first go into Jackie's house, poverty is not the first word that springs to mind. But clearly there are some serious financial problems. Jackie might be struggling, but according to one official measurement, she's not in fact in poverty. That's known as the relative income measurement. It defines poverty as being an income that's less than 60% of the median or middle point income adjusted for the makeup of the household. The relative poverty measurement works like this. Now let's say that this line represents the median income across all of society, and this line represents 60% of the median. Now this measurement says that anyone living on this income or less is living in poverty. That may sound simple, but this measure of poverty is in fact quite controversial. Some say it overstates the number of people who are really in poverty. 
this 60% median income for child figure is, is a very, very broad statistic, one that really only measures the distribution of income in the country, not, not actual child poverty. And I think that it has been seized on by certain campaign groups and activists because it produces, it tends to produce such a, a lurid headline figure. And I think we need to ask ourselves whose interests are really served by uh, cooking up these enormous numbers, uh, painting problems that are effectively too large to solve. Look around us, this is not a society of Dickensian deprivation. There are serious problems, there are people in serious need, but that's all the more reason to focus in on them and stop grandstanding on these grandiose political projects. There are other ways to measure poverty, where instead of looking at income, you look at what a family can or cannot afford. This is called the consensual measure of poverty. It defines a list of essential necessities. Amongst other things, these include being able to face unexpected expenses, to pay bills and arrears, to have a meal with meat, chicken or fish every second day, to keep your home warm and to have a washing machine. If you can't afford two or more of these items, you're defined as being in poverty. Jackie is a classic example of someone who f uh, fits the, the consensual poverty measure. There are basic things that she can't afford, uh, but she, she actually falls outside the, uh, the official median income child poverty measure. And that really indicates what, what a, a hopelessly broad measure the income measurement of poverty is. It, uh, it may be taking in half the population, but even within that half may not be the right people. This is what happens when you play this, this very broad statistical game, uh, one that I think really only serves to generate headlines for pressure groups. It's Thursday night, and I'm driving Jackie to an ATM machine near her house. Her benefits have been put into her account, and she says she's about to take all of them out at once in cash. What is it that you're doing now? I go right now on a Thursday night and just take my money out of the bank. This just shows really how, out of necessity, Jackie has to think in the short term. So she knows her benefits are in tonight, it's Thursday night, but she also knows that tomorrow some direct debits are going to come out of her account. So she's here getting it out in cash first. Now that inevitably is going to lead to bank charges when she misses those direct debits. But right now she's not thinking about that. She's thinking about the money she needs over the next few days just to get by and she will deal with the consequences later. It seems clear that Jackie is locked in a vicious cycle, making decisions that will make things worse, but feeling like she has no choice. The night we accompanied her to the bank machine where she was taking... Roger Bailey is a psychologist who has worked with adults and children who have been in consistent poverty. He says Jackie's behaviour is not uncommon. When you're living in consistent poverty, uh, you're living under conditions of consistent stress because there's a demand to provide resources and, and you don't have the means to do that. So you're continually on the edge. We lose sight of the future, we, we lose sight of the capacity to uh, plan and to hope and to have aspirations and we start to live for the present just for the day. How do you explain the kind of behaviour where someone might withdraw all of their money to avoid banking direct debits when, when that person knows that they're going to incur big bank charges. You're psychologically less able to plan for the future and you're, you're, you're more disabled by, by stress so you, you start to think in immediate terms. What you're doing is just trying to cope with the next few hours or the next few days. Um, you, you're not thinking about the future. The future's going to look after itself. It'll come. It's not going to be good anyway because there's nothing you can do to change it. So you just try and make today a bit better than uh, it would have been otherwise. Back at the house, Jackie shows me where this week's money is going. How is this going to divide up then? This is rent I already had aside. Right, so you put this aside for rent, yep. yeah. So that's 120 mm -hmm. and that's to be made there. 250. Right. So that's 120, 40, 60, 80, 2, 20, 40, 50. That's rent. Right. Right. That's gas and electric. Mm -hmm. That's what he owed to get me through the week because I had to borrow money to get me through till till Friday. Right. Who did you borrow that off? Family. Right, okay. That's to go on a loan that I pay weekly. Right. And that's mine. Ten pounds left over? Yep. So tell me about this loan here, this forty pounds. What mm -hmm. what's that for? That's money I borrowed to get Christmas more or less. Right. And just pay it off weekly. 
Last year, Jackie borrowed £800 from a private loan company. She pays back as much as she can afford each week. Is debt part of the problem here, would you say, in terms of... Oh, reading? yeah, definitely. Because it's, it's, it is a circle that is hard to get out of, you know. You're getting what some people would call easy money. You know, you're able to get a loan of two, three hundred pounds to get you through a sticky patch. Mm -hmm. But then you're paying it off. So you it know, has a so knock-on effect? It's robbing Peter to pay Paul every week. That's just how it goes. That's life on benefits. Jackie says she took out the loan in full knowledge of the terms and conditions and says that when it's paid off, she can't rule out getting another one. One professor at Queen's University has just completed a major study of the causes and effects of poverty. I think when you're in a crisis uh, and you're under pressure with children and such like, it's uh, very easy to take uh, the si simple quick loan that is being advertised on the TV or that you can get access to on the internet and very quickly you're in, you're in serious trouble. So I think it's, it's becoming increasingly common that people are taking out high interest short term loans and getting into difficulty. Jennifer McCann is a Sinn Féin MLA representing the West Belfast constituency, but she's also a junior minister in the Stormont Executive with responsibility for tackling child poverty. She says she's very concerned about what she's seeing on the ground in West Belfast. I am seeing families who don't know how they're going to um, get through uh, by the end of the week in terms of heating their homes and buying food. Why their children wouldn't be starving, I'm not suggesting that, but they're going without. They're going without, they're going without food, they're going without heating their homes, and they're also going without the other things that other children in more affluent families um, are taking for granted. Jackie was in full-time employment until four and a half years ago. She says the transition to a life on benefits has been difficult not just financially, but psychologically too. There's times that you have nothing to do at home, you know, if you're on top of everything and the kids aren't home from school till four, three, half three, four o'clock. You've everything done, you know, you do, you, you literally do find yourself sitting fiddling, twiddling your thumbs, doing that much, do you know what I mean? And then you're in bed for about nine, half nine, so nine times out of ten it feels as though you've wasted a day. Does it get you down? It can do, yeah. Yeah. But that's why I take myself off walking and clear my head. Do you think there's a way out of this cycle through getting into employment? Because that's what the government wants. The government wants people in your position to start. If I had the opportunity to go back to work, I'd be there. I, I would. But when it comes to the world of work and the opportunities for getting back into work, Jackie's situation really reveals what's known as the poverty trap. That's because she feels that by going back to work, she could make her situation even more financially precarious. I would love to go back to work, but it wouldn't pay me to go back to work. If I was to go back to work, I would have to pay full rent on this house myself. And if I was to go back to work, I could only go part time because of my kids and I could only go part time because if I went full time, I would lose my housing benefit. So it's, it's, you have to weigh up, is it feasible for me to go back to work? So, is it? We took Jackie's details to Les Allenby, an expert on benefits, and asked him to calculate what working again at the minimum wage would mean. I looked at what a position would be if she worked 16 hours, or 30 hours, or 37 and a half hours, and She's better off in work than on benefit, but there are some paradoxes. For example, if she goes into work for 16 hours a week, then she's better off about £90 plus a week. However, we need to then take into account what might her, her child cost be, her transport to work, etc. But it looks as if she'll be better off because you can get help uh, with the tax credit system for childcare. However, if she increases her hours from 16 hours to 30 hours, she's actually not as well off as she would be working part-time and if she moved from 30 hours for example to 37 and a half hours 
then what you see is she's about £3.50 a week better off by doing an extra seven and a half hours a week. So for her, part-time work is a much better option than full-time work. Isn't it a real paradox that working 16 hours a week, Jackie could be £90 better off, but if she works full-time, she's only £73 a week better off. I mean, that, that's bizarre. It is. It's what I call the snakes and ladders of the benefit system. There are a number of ladders when you move into work that make a great deal of sense. However, there are a number of snakes. And it's not a straightforward issue where you can say absolutely every lone parent is better off by working or absolutely every couple with children are better off by working. It depends on your circumstances, the number of children you have, whether there's a disability, whether you've got a carer's benefit. All of that has to be factored in. These are precisely the kind of inconsistencies that a new benefit system will attempt to address. But for Jackie, one of the biggest factors in going back to work would be paying for childcare. The average uh, two-parent family and one child will be uh, spending 44% of their overall income on childcare. If you are uh, looking for part-time work, as many people are, it just doesn't become payable. So that's one of the big issues kind of going forward. If we want to tackle and get more people out to work, then we've got to make childcare affordable and accessible. And that's one of the growing problems in relation to those who aren't working. Welfare reform is currently being discussed by the Committee for Social Development. But as of yet, there's no timetable for implementation. The changes are based around a new system called universal credit. According to the minister in charge of implementing it here, universal credit will help people like Jackie get back into work without being penalised by the system. With universal credit, people will be better off always in work than out of work. And if you take on more hours, you will automatically be better off. The benefit trap is done away with. It's abolished under the, under the new system. The final detail of universal credit for Northern Ireland is yet to be published, but it's clear there will be winners and losers. If you're looking at individual households, around 102,000 households will be better off by around an average of about £35 a week. There will be another 99,000 households that will be basically the same position uh, as they are at present. And over 80,000 households where they will be around £34 a week worse off. Welfare reform poses huge problems for Northern Ireland. The Institution for Fiscal Studies has carried out a survey on behalf of the Office of the First and Deputy First Minister which shows that Northern Ireland will be second only to London in terms of the worst effects of the welfare reform. That's because we have larger family sizes here, that's because more people are on low incomes, that's because we have more people on benefits. Yet even for those who might lose out, the Minister says the new system does offer some protection. For those who would be potentially worse off, there is transitional protection. And the transitional protection is the assurance that when the changes come, they will remain as they are at present until the point might come in the future at some time when their circumstances change. It's not clear whether Jackie will get less under the new system or more. But for now, she's struggling to get by. She says her main priority is that the children never go hungry. Every second Friday when her benefits allow, Jackie does her main food shopping. Well, well I've said shopping done. How much did you spend there then? Um, £70 in total. And how long will this do you for? That will probably do maybe about a week and a half. A week and a half? Would you be keeping a close eye when you're in there and exactly oh, how yeah. much? Yeah, yeah, count as I'm going around to as, make sure. As you're going along. Yeah. So then, at a time when you run out of cash, then presumably you'll have some of this yeah, in the freezer? Yeah, I'll back up and, and have this. Back at the house, Sean and Anya are home from school and ready for dinner. Tonight it's chicken pieces, mash and tin spaghetti. Do you find it difficult feeding yourself from the kids on limited resources? Yeah, you can't, you can't buy fresh meat every day. So mm. What about fresh fruit and veg, that kind of stuff? They do get the fresh fruit now, but yeah. fresh meat every day is hard to do, you know. So on a weekday it's normally potatoes, 
beans, spaghetti, and chicken nuggets, fish fingers, or dinosaurs. Yeah. Yeah. Jackie makes sure the children have a cooked dinner every night, although it's usually only on a Sunday that it will include fresh meat. You two are, are gobbling that up. It looks all right. Is it nice? Mm -hmm. See, can I have some? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> would you go out to, to eat at all? No, not, not regularly. I mean, it would be special occasions. Where's your favourite place when you do go out to eat out? Like Goodfellas or McDonald's or anything. Right, Goodfellas. When was the last time you were at Goodfellas? About a year ago. A year, two, ago? Two, a year, or two, a year or two? Mm -hmm. Food prices have gone up 32% in the last five years. And in the greater Belfast area, gas prices have gone up by 87% in a decade. It's not just those on benefits who are feeling the pinch. Wages in the private and public sectors have also struggled to keep up with soaring food and fuel prices. Everything's constantly rising. I mean, there's a letter I got this morning that the gas has gone up again. So once the gas goes up, that's going to be more out of my money every week. So this is a price increase, it says here, of 8.7% mm -hmm. from the 1st of first April. Of April. But your benefits aren't going up by No, they're not going up by a bit. No, they'll not be going up at all. Mm. And if the gas goes up, the electric will go up. 42% of consumers in Northern Ireland are reported as living in fuel poverty, which is defined as a family or household spending more than 10% of its income on heating the home. Ten pound on each cash. Jackie's gas and electricity work on a top-up card system. She buys top-up points at the local corner shop and then adds credit at two access points in the house. She says that rising prices mean she's cutting back on other necessities to keep the lights on and the house warm enough. The problem for Jackie isn't so much welfare reform, which will change how her benefits are paid, but rather austerity measures brought in at Westminster. It's these restrictions which could really affect her. From April 1st, there will be a 1% inflationary cap on most benefits. Those are things that I do not find at all palatable. Uh, they are things that are being driven from Westminster, things over which we do not have any local control. Um, and I think there are going to be real challenges that come in that way. So it's not something that I would want to defend. It's a question that really needs put to the Treasury in London. And the focus needs to be on what we have control over, rather than the things over which we have no control, such as the 1%. Isn't it the case, really, that when it comes to softening the blow of welfare reform or benefits cuts, that there's very little the executive here can do, that your hands are tied? Within the constraints of parity, we are doing everything we can to ensure that there's an adequate system to protect and support the most vulnerable. The principle of parity means that the system in place here in Northern Ireland must broadly match the Westminster welfare model. If the executive here chooses a different approach, any shortfall has to be paid for locally. But there are those even within the executive who think there should be more room for manoeuvre. We can't just be lifting what's happening in Westminster and putting it into place here. We shouldn't be tied into that issue of parity the way we are. I believe we need to do it differently. Um, while we are um, sort of tied into a block grant, if you like, we are tied into how we, pay, how we actually spend that block grant and how we do those interventions and those services and support mechanisms that we need to be putting into families. The benefit cap is going to impact more here on, on families, lone parent families, for instance. It's going to have a bigger impact on families who have five children or more. We're going to see over 3,000 children that's going to be negatively impacted by this, this cap. 3,000 children who could be put into poverty or kept there by, by this measure? Yes, exactly. That's exactly what will happen. Another major issue for people at the lowest end of the income scale is the cost of housing. There's a shortage of appropriate social housing in Northern Ireland, which means that many people on benefits are forced to rent from private landlords, usually paying far more than they would for a council house. This is one of Jackie's biggest expenses. Added to this, her housing benefit has been cut from £114 a week to £104 a week. Losing just that £10 per week has made a huge difference to Jackie. 
my housing benefit has dropped to £104 a week. Mm. And I'm sure there's people out there going, well, at least you're getting housing benefit. Mm. But my rent is 550 So maybe 140 I have to make up 40 a month. a month you have to make up mm -hmm. out of your other benefits? Because of the cutbacks and because the housing benefit has dropped, it means I'm paying more. But I have no disposable income to pay it. So whatever money I have coming in, then I have to work right. What's going towards rent? Well, if the rent's to be paid, there's no food shopping. Jackie says her rent eats up so much of her benefits that she now has no option but to move. I can't afford to keep this. I can't. So what's happened is I've had to go and put my name down for temporary accommodation. So what's going to happen? Well, that could mean going into a hostel. Moving to temporary accommodation would mean Jackie could make big savings on rent. But it would also mean that she and the children would be leaving the place they've called home for the last two years. If Jackie were to leave her home for a hostel, this is the kind of place she and the children might move to. It's temporary accommodation in West Belfast and Sister Bernadette, who runs it, has agreed to show me around. Sister Harry, Good morning, Declan. So this morning, is one of the temporary accommodation units then? Yes, we have 17 units right. and they're always full up. They're always full? Always full. Do you think that cuts to housing benefit are putting more pressure on facilities like this? Well, yes, we would always have encouraged people to go into private rental, you know, rather than spend two or three years in a hostel. And now that option is not there because they said they don't have the money to pay the difference. And that difference, it could be £100 a month, it could be even more. I have had people come in here who said I was down there at the housing executive queuing for three hours every morning, maybe from five o'clock, you know, to get in there first. How often does a spare unit come up? Oh, you could have one week and you might have two and you could go four months really with no move. The temporary accommodation is perfectly reasonable and comfortable but when it comes to Jackie and her children moving here you can't help but think about how disruptive that would be. This would not be an easy move for them and that's because there's no certainty about how long they would be here or where they would go next. Later this year, housing benefit will be squeezed again by controversial new measures under the Welfare Reform Act. It's become known as the bedroom tax. And it means that anyone of working age in receipt of housing benefit who has a spare bedroom will lose up to 14% of their benefit. Having a second spare room could see them lose 25%. This tax won't affect Jackie, whose bedrooms are all full, but the Northern Ireland Housing Executive says that 32,000 people here will be directly affected. If we were to depart from that and not follow the same line as in Great Britain, where the coalition government has introduced this, the cost to Northern Ireland would be around £17 million a year. Wherever we depart from parity, it has to be paid for out of our block grant. And that's the same block grant that pays for hospitals, the same block grant that pays for schools, the same block grant that deals with all of our government departments. I think that this is one of the most difficult, the most contentious of all the changes that are being brought forward in welfare reform. So I see you're a Liverpool fan. Jackie says she's honest with the children about the family's lack of money. Sean says his main complaint is that he can't buy the latest computer games. But even he recognises that sometimes there isn't enough for necessities. Um, yeah, I mean, when we don't have any money, it's just like, like we have to survive off what we have got in the fridge, freezers, cupboards, you know, that there. And when there's nothing else to make dinner with, sometimes I just make wee so much. Make a sandwich. Yeah. There. Sometimes difficult decisions have to be made. After Easter, 10-year-old Anya will be moving to a school that's within walking distance. 
Jackie says that's because she can no longer afford to pay the £10 a week it costs to get Anya transport to her current school. But that comes with its own cost, a new school uniform. Your colour there, isn't it? It might be amazing for some people watching this to think that for the sake of £10 a week, a little girl is going to move from one school to another. From one school to another. I know. To save that. Yeah. But I suppose if, if you're trying to get by on 40 or £50 disposable income, that makes a big difference. It will make a difference, yeah. That's, that's, that's more money on your gas or more money on your electric or something else off your rent. Anya told us she doesn't mind moving school. And it seems that in her day-to-day -day life, she's become accustomed to there being a shortage of money in the household. Do you ever ask for things or want things that you have to wait for? Yeah. Like what? Like if I said to my do you have any money so I can go to the shop to get something? And she says, no, I don't have any money or she gives me money. So if money was no object and you had Lots of it. What would you get yourself, do you think? I would get a tin of Coke or a pack of crisps and some, like, a mix-up or something. Right. So some nice stuff to eat. Yeah. What effect does living in consistent poverty have on children? It has a profound effect on children. I mean, firstly, parents who are suffering chronic poverty uh, are suffering chronic stress and the children are learning all the time that the world is not a safe place that there are threats every day and every week that can affect the family and that mum can't protect them from those and that means that the children themselves are living under constant stress the Stormont department responsible for tackling child poverty is the office of the first and deputy first minister in 2011, they published a child poverty strategy and issued an update last year. The strategy's aim is to eradicate child poverty by 2020. But Save the Children says, in fact, it's on the rise and that by 2020, 34% of children in Northern Ireland will be in persistent poverty, up from 21% now. How realistic, really, is the goal of eradicating child poverty by 2020. It's just not going to happen, is it? It's certainly going to be very challenging. We don't underestimate the challenge that we are facing, but we're determined. Uh, we're going to give 100%. We got somewhere in the region of £4 billion pounds less to spend. So we have to cut the cake proportionately and appropriately. That doesn't stop us being strategic in what we're seeking to do. So the strategic early intervention uh, that we're doing within OFM, DFM, around uh, delivering social change, but also coordinating all the government departments. That's bringing health, and Edwin Prout's bringing education, John O'Dowd's bringing all the different departments together and coordinating the response. Those are all strategic measures that can work and can make a difference, and I've seen them making a difference. But some say the government needs to be more realistic. The absurdity of trying to eradicate poverty by 2020 is highlighted by the, the statistical measure. We can only do that by instituting a socialist paradise, giving everyone almost the same wage. And even if Stormont wanted to do that, it couldn't. I think this really explains why over the last two Stormont terms, whenever it's been asked to come up with a child poverty strategy, all it can do is produce meaningless waffle because it has set itself a goal that, that literally can't be achieved, not with its powers, perhaps not with any government's powers. How many months is in the year? Twelve. Right, eight. Jackie wants to find her own way out of poverty for her and her children. But she's struggling against a backdrop of uncertainty about where they'll be living, how much they'll have to live on, and what the next few years will bring. But in many ways, she feels that thinking about the future is simply a luxury she can't afford. What does the future hold for you, do you think? I have no idea. As Do I you say, think about it, or is it? No. As I say, just take take each day as it comes.